I'm Kalle Sergesso. I'm here today to talk about neighborhood DevOps or organizations in DevOps. And I will try to go through some anti-types, uh, some actual working types, and some experience I have on using them in production environments, test environments, development, and real life use cases where I have sold myself to technique with these processes. So I am always here, so I said, I work as a director at Ethical. I have 17 people in my team at the moment in three sites. Uh, I've been at Ethical for four years. I did some games before coming to Ethical and studied in Kajani, went to Germany, moved back to Ger Ger uh, from Germany to Finland. Um, I have some opinions that Christo Raptor would like, but uh, not good for video. So, yeah. And when I was young, I did some bookkeeping for nine years, family business and so on. Um, please do comment if you have any like uh, questions or comparable. And my today's view uh, is supposed to challenge and hopefully create some conversations. So please attack as much as you feel like. Um, about ethical, we are a uh, software development, uh, so DevOps consulting house with about 250 people, and of those, about 130 plus uh, is in DevOps field, and we do about 80 projects at the same time, all the time, and we've been doing these ethical root services from 2014. So I have been involved from the very beginning. And we have thousands of users and we want some awards. Okay, so actually to my topic, which is the DevOps antitypes and then the DevOps uh, teams. So um, hopefully we'll, we will figure out why these don't work. So the first one, the good old dev and ops silo, the very beginning where it started, very where we very did everything. So at first you start in the dev and then you throw it over to the ops through the wall. Hopefully you have some kind of like Viva here and then you use effect in Finland here and then you throw it over, effect has all your incidents, your change management and you are like, yeah, we don't need to send these to the developers, they don't care. And the developers are, we have these block reports and we don't need to show them to the uh, operations, they don't care. Um, this one works in small scale. Um, works, well, never in DevOps work, but uh, it worked. It worked in uh, slow processes when we were waterfall. In Agile, we are supposed to go live every two weeks. Everything changes every two weeks. You can't do that. So uh, we started implementing them together. And we did it badly, multiple times. We created DevOps silos, for example. There is an example how these work, but this is not the way of doing it, that you create DevOps teams which are in the team and the DevOps squad person just sits in the team and his job is to be one more silo. So you have another unit that you throw, the dev developers throw code and the uh, DevOps consultant the, or DevOps person does work and then the uh, operations takes a responsibility. So we just added more people, nothing else. Uh, we are still doing code here without knowing where it's going to production. We're doing uh, deployment pipelines or uh, build processes here without understanding what's happening in the software or without understanding what's happening in operations. It works for a while because there is a working model of these guys existing for a while and then helping these two to work together. But it, uh, in the long run, it starts to slow down because these guys start to create uh, more enterprise politics because they want to keep their jobs. And boom, it breaks. 
this is uh, one I face that uh, uh, one software project that I was where we were like uh, what ops. So we had amazing development where we went to production all the time. Uh, we had a person doing DevOps, but nobody doing operations. So people were coding, stuff was going to production, but nobody cared about uh, what the operations look like. What is like the long term? How are we managing backups? Where is the databases running? How are we running things? What's the uh, upgrade process? Uh, how do we, all, all of that. It's like, it works and then it blows up to your face and you're like, but why didn't this DevOps person think about this? Or um, at that point, the developers are, well, we didn't think about this. And the DevOps guys, it's not my role to think about it. And then the operations that don't exist, nobody tells them that, hey, it's pretty stupid that we didn't, don't have backups. Normal thing. Uh, tools teams. So once again, you take DevOps and you push it into a small area in the team, not making it into a team responsibility. And you uh, create a team within a team to manage the build pipeline. And then you wonder, uh, how does the build actually work? You go and ask from the developer and the developer is, I don't know, ask for the DevOps guy. And then the operations come and ask, how do I make this to go production? I don't know, ask the DevOps guy. And boom, you're and once again making a DevOps team. This works once again on short term, because the information gets shared between these two for a while, and then it blows up because the person is too busy. Or doesn't understand what we are doing because he doesn't have visibility. The American style. So, uh, if you have noticed in USA, a lot of us uh, see this amazing trend where uh, you have the developers and you have the operations still separate, but your organization is, yeah, yeah, we're doing DevOps. And then you look at it and you're like, but that's not the DevOps position, that's a, that's a sysadmin. No, 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 it's a sysadmin, uh, it's a DevOps person. And that's happening in a lot of companies, and it's just hiding, uh, hiding the point behind a nice topic. And that's happening everywhere, all the time. Um, I don't have any examples of this from my own experience because I don't let it happen. Embed everything. So, yeah. It is theoretical, should work, but the problem becomes that uh, your operations uh, problems become the developers' problems and the DevOps people's problems. And at that point, uh, nobody focuses on the product or the customer experience. Everybody's focusing on the operations because that's the what thing that's blowing up all the time. There is issues, there is uh, things that we don't know what's working. We, have, we know these problems and we are fixing them all the time and all of a sudden nobody is focusing on what the customers want. And as we, as we can see with all the examples uh, of great successful products, uh, that's not good. Everybody should know what the customer wants. And this is what happened in uh, one of my pro projects where we tried to uh, do everything in together and we ended up forgetting the customer and we brought out some really stupid stuff and we just focused on getting things working. So, for example, in Ethicode we have a root product and we started out so that everything is embedded. Well, nobody was doing product development in after three years because we had so much technical debt and nobody cared. Like, we were too focused on what's the operational thing, where are we going to think about product development. So uh, that led us to separate the development from the operations and creating the DevOps team, like creating DevOps style of working. Uh, that seems to work pretty well. Um, then the uh, enterprise favorite. Hey, 
We have the developers, we have the operations, and let's throw in DPAs. So I don't really know why this is here, because it should be its own big ball where every query goes and dies. So you type SQL and then you send it to uh, the DBA and the DBA looks at it and says, I need to optimize this. And three months later, he gets back to you that did you still need it? I now, I now have time to optimize it. And then you're like, we actually already did it with MongoDB because our databases can't be used. And then uh, the DBA is like, but MongoDB is not supported at your yeah, we don't have any backups, but it's there, like it's running and we can push data and we can do any query we want. Oops. Um, yeah. This is something probably that everybody who has been in a big company has seen. So that's the antitypes. That's how we fail. And that's where we learn. Failure is just uh, one way of learning. Well, actually the first step. I like to fail. That's where you learn. And that's where you create teams, like shared responsibility. You start working together without uh, taking apart the fact that you have operations and developers. There is no DevOps team. There is just common goals and the operation is responsible of operations and developers are responsible of development, but they are working together. They are having that uh, daily stand up where they stand up and discuss about these things together practically speaking, and they try to find uh, possibilities. For example, in ethical, we kind of do this at the moment in root. Uh, I lead these operations, and we call how is this development, and we have uh, two big scrums with both teams. Uh, I have a scrum where I keep uh, track of what the developers need from operations, and Mika keeps track of what we need from the, the uh, them. And then we share those to know, prioritize and think about with team, where do we go? What can we offer in next two weeks for team development and what can developers offer to us in next two weeks? And we find those uni unifying things and trying to bring things to production with good quality. Uh, the Google model. Um, so SREs. Um, it's a good model if you're Google. It's a really bad model if you're not Google. Like, if you're doing things automated, if you're really well doing everything, well, then it makes sense that you have such a piece of code. Develop, DevOps people who do develop, DevOps features, and then you have the developers and operations focusing on what they're good at. But if you're not uh, in that level of automation or in there, it's really hard to implement. You have to have everything in tip top shape for SREs to work. Or then you can just rename to DevOps consultant, use it as a rename DevOps consultant. Yeah, it's a good model and I don't have anything against it, but it is a hard thing to go with. Uh, external services, so this is how it looks like uh, outside. So. You have your uh, developers, your operations, and we offer tool sets that can be used as a consulting, for example. This works in certain amounts. Doesn't always, but you can buy, uh, kind of like buy the external service of helping you out in bringing these to closer. It should, in the end, move like this, where you just help with this on that journey. Um, works on small, small scale really well. Uh, DevOps as an ERS, so infrastructure as a service. So in here, the DevOps people work together uh, with the operations to get the infrastructure coding and all that stuff ready for the operations. This wall is kind of close to these and together, but because it would look stupid compared to other pictures, it's drawn here. So these guys sit with developers, think about what it looks like, and bring that to operations, like this is what we need. And then ABS deploy, and there is operations managing it. So if you have seen the managed cloud services, that's what's being done here. So here we specify, this is what we want, and this is how it works, and here they deploy it. 
Um, that's in use in most of the managed clouds at the moment. Uh, evangelists. So this is a lot of corporates that have done this have had a good success. For example, we have Sami here who used to be an evangelist, I guess. So the idea is that you have the DevOps uh, by having these two teams bit by bit coming together because somebody is there like helping them out by, hey, this is DevOps, please look at it. It's amazing. And then these two teams start to think about, hey, maybe we should do DevOps. It's really slow, really painful. And in the end, it usually breaks down on uh, the fact that the teams just take too long. Uh, but it's being used in multiple projects. Uh, containers, so... This is not the model I agree with, because I have never seen it work properly. So the idea is that developers make containers and throw them to operations with DevOps people. Uh, I don't know how many of you have worked with the uh, Docker containers, but uh, you can do really bad stuff with them. Like most people use volumes or something like that, and all of a sudden it doesn't work in your Kubernetes. It doesn't work in your OpenShift, or you deploy something that's not suitable for OpenShift. That's why most of the OpenShift uh, operations here, for example, fail. Because we're throwing containers to a team that can't upkeep the containers because nobody has told them this is the best practice. Okay. Uh, this is my favorite model. So this is what Ethical does the most. Express. You do the model that I was talking about as a bad model. Create a DevOps team. You throw in a DevOps person to every team to make sure operations and developers work. And you tell that team, you have six months and this guy is gone, work together or get screwed. We're expecting DevOps. That's how many companies do it. And all of a sudden, these guys have a lot of things to upkeep and these guys have a lot of things to help these guys to upkeep. This guy is here as a technical resource, helping them out, but all of a sudden, if this guy leaves, and I recommend him throwing him out of the company, because then nobody can send him an email, call him, or anything else, everything will just break down, then this and this have, have to work together after that, or the whole process was useless, and then your team, a project manager or product owner can be, what the, what are you doing? Like, could you please? And usually at that point, developers start thinking with their brains. And operations start thinking with, we actually need to do something together. And cooperation. So uh, this is my last of the well, second last of these, because it's the perfect model where you just overlap a bit and try to work together in this small area where you need to. Um, it's the hardest thing to do. What is something that the uh, operations need to know from development, but what is something that they don't need to know? What is something that developers need to know from operations, but uh, developer, uh, operations doesn't need to know? Mapping that is really hard. Like, Thinking about where do we sit, place something, it's really hard. It's almost impossible. And that's why uh, the model in the very beginning is usually where you end up, where you make shared responsibility. If it doesn't work, all of you are screwed and wake up at 4 a.m. to fix it. Instead of trying to be here, where it's shared responsibility, but you wake up the correct people, the people who know if it's trouble. And then we have the DBA solution where we create a lot of different uh, development DB, DB, DB development DBA uh, working together with the team. So 
We have a DPA team that is working with the operations and we have a DPA in the team that is working with the team to optimize automatically. Mm. It's still a bad model. The DPAs are kind of useless in the team if the team doesn't do a lot of SQL. And in the operations they will still throw away that guy's uh, SQL because they are like well, I didn't write it, so I'm not putting it into production. Um, yeah. There is no good solution for DPAs at the moment. So, uh, I've been talking about the uh, antitypes and the types, and nobody has asked me any questions or comments or anything, but next I will tell how we try to aim and work with this. So, as ethical rule, uh, these guys are responsible of DevOps, so tools, work, working ways, uh, pipelines, production, all that. Well, do they need to work on tools? No. Tools could be provided as a service and then uh, you just work on top of those. If they work. Uh, you have to still be able to choose what you are developing, when you are developing, where, to, where do you deploy, how do you deploy and when do you deploy. So you can offer your, uh, your Jira Confluence Jenkins to the team, but the team has to be able to affect on what is being offered. And in root, we aim to offer to our customers uh, the tools, and then those uh, teams can then work forward with the, team, the tools. So we have the tools, and you're responsible of what you what do you use those tools with. So. This is my most aggressive slide, and if nobody comments, I'm going to be really, really sad. <coughs> so, a console that costs in Finland about 110 euros per hour at the moment. Um, they usually, uh, usually go to the DevOps teams as a transformation experts. Their job is to transform that team to a culture that was here, 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 any of these. Something that's working for that organization as a DevOps co-working. And usually what they end up is that they start upkeeping those tools. Let's say you have a Jenkins. They install a Jenkins. They start upkeeping the Jenkins. You have it, uh, you have don't have Git, they install you your Git and they start using that Git. Then they end up upkeeping or upkeeping that Git. So Boom, 10% of time easily gone to that. Bringing in tools. Well, I asked our consultants in Finland, and 10% is not enough. They said 50% of the time they are ending up upkeeping Git, PFS, SharePoint, uh, any of these tools. They just end up there because they are there and they know about the tool. It's a complete waste of time from them, because they are supposed to be there to help the DevOps team. But yeah, that's what happens. No comments on this either. Right. A lot of money. Yes, it's a lot of money. Yes, but it's good to be consultant. <laughs> no, consultants don't earn this like you have your all kinds of taxes and all other shit. Yeah. It actually mean that uh, Epico provides a consultant to a company to refine their DevOps operations and the consultant ends up doing something like maintaining the GitHub repository. Yes. Or something like so the question is wasting money. Yes, so the question was that uh, Epico is providing a consultant and his job is to help refine the processes and bringing the tools and things to life with the team and making the team upkeep it. And then that consultant ends up with uh, upkeeping and supporting and maintenance something like GitHub repositories or pull requests. And based on the research, again, we're looking into it more depth, but yeah, that's what happens in a lot of teams. And that's why we created the code rule to sort out the uh, things and create the upkeeping of the environment so that the teams can focus on tools. Uh, Two teams can focus on DevOps and tools are there. 
That's why you have a big bucket of offering pipelines. That's why you have a GitHub, a GitLab, all that thing, all those things being offered as a service. So the teams could focus on DevOps, not the tools. So how do you build this? How do we build this? As how, a how do you sell it? I mean, it, it has to be different if we have a team of 10 persons or 500 developers. So the question was, how do we build it and how do we upkeep it So uh, for different teams? So uh, the idea is that uh, if you have 10 people, it's a bit too small for ethical. But there is a lot of good cloud services like Bitbucket Pipeline, Zero, Confluence as well to help you getting started. Uh, 100 people, uh, you start using something like centralized authentication, like you have Azure AD through Office 365. Okay, we take in uh, tools that work with that. We take in Bitbucket, Confluence, Zero, and Yankees, for example. We integrate that together, uh, connect it to Azure AD, set up a Jenkins with uh, permission models like Foldery, so that there is permissions in multi uh, multi to our crates and provide the uh, Jenkins uh, agents as uh, on demand. So we use Kubernetes, for example, and we deploy a Kubernetes cluster and help you manage in there all the agents. So you deploy agents, it goes to a cluster. We just up, um, add more loads there when needed. Um, Artifactor supports up to 10,000 users easily. Um, yeah, most of it is more about the configuration of the tools, like helping you help yourself. Yeah. Uh, you can see obviously there are lots of tools. Yeah. Can, you, can you give estimates to your clients, like for example, how much, uh, like let's say you would recommend like, hey, out of this, we'll do this type of configuration. And how much would it cost if we are running, let's say, I don't know, like 100, 100 builds per day or something? Okay, so uh, the question was, can we do a cost, exp uh, cost analysis for per, uh, how many builds you do per day? Or yeah. for like a specific, like for the number of people? For a specific yeah. number of people, yes, we do that all the time. Yes. So do you, do you know this as a hosted solution or can we install it on our premises on your so at the moment it's hosted solution, but it can be deployed on premise with uh, ethical of taking care of the main dance and so on. But it's not uh, yet as open source or deployable packages. Anybody from here? Did I not make anybody mad, please? But you didn't put a price tag on this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I tried to make aggressive strides this time. Yeah. Yeah. More a comment, not really a question. Uh, maybe I'm in, in the minority here, but I work in an embedded world, so yeah. we just cannot and will not deploy like every two weeks, even every, every two months. Two years is probably something more realistic. So, uh, uh, kind of be all the cloudiness and, and managing the environments and, and making sure that the, the the products are reporting back to the, back to the mothership and stuff like that. So the monitoring thing and the analytics is probably not something uh, that is suitable for us. But uh, by the way, your slides just disappeared. Oh, uh, <laughs> uh, oh. but. Uh, uh, can I be? Um, I don't know. I'm trying to grasp like uh, the so dev, whatever people think of as DevOps is really really interesting and hard, even if you just totally skip the whole ops. <laughs> so kind of the cultural shift of going to the whatever you think is DevOps model is really good and valuable, even though you just totally did step. Yeah. Yeah. So in embedded word, uh, the comment was about embedded word and the uh, fact that you can do the same things on embedded word usually, like this doesn't exist, this doesn't exist. You can't really deploy that often because deploying 
uh, is hard to embed. Well, uh, you can also do stuff where you can deploy faster to embed, uh, but uh, no, in your case, not. But most, like, if you're doing IoT, you can do it. But if you're doing certain stuff, no. And uh, the idea behind it is that uh, uh, you can use the best practices and the tooling and so on and prepare for that deployment every two years in certain cases and prepare mentally for that horrible evening with embedded devices. Uh, sorry, I don't have answer to the deep embedded uh, features in this case because I know too much, but I could tell you that in uh, IoT I would set up so that we can deploy all the time if it was not uh, this field. Yeah, but yeah. I'm you didn't mention the, the field. field. field so, so we have to actually have to get uh, official approval from FDA for the track map administration and, and EU uh, directly to be fulfilled that such. But that's. Yeah, and that's, that's the very I chose, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. But the idea behind medical field is that you have the FDA approvals, and then you can't actually deploy whenever you feel like. You can only deploy when FDA says that hey, our sixteen other guys have gone through your six thousand pages of regulation and auditing, and we've also done some more auditing, and we would need these three questions answered. What's your age? What's your blood type? And are you sure uh, that your birth year is not this and that? Okay, you feel this, okay, maybe we can go. As a like, example of what the audit ends up. Because there is a lot of regulation in that field. For the automated testing part, yeah. uh, can't see from the slides. That it's a great robot framework. Yeah, this robot framework is this. What's this second thingy there? Is there something? No, oh. it's empty. Yeah, okay. We didn't want to type anything else. Okay. The code is very heavy in robot. Yeah. Also, my time ran out, so if you were busy going to next meeting, it's, I have time, but if you don't. Any other comments? Very good comments so far and questions, thank you. Yeah. Uh, for the binary storage, yeah. uh, Artifactor is great, no question about it. Tends to be expensive, I would say. No. Well, have you used Nexus? Yeah, that's what kind of. I haven't used any other products. I, I recommend using sort of that Nexus, and you agree that it's pretty cheap to have Artifactor. Okay. Uh, sorry if you are some of that person here, but yeah, sadly it's uh, pain. They, for example, between version 2 to version 3, they remove REST API completely. It's not bad, but there's such development kind of going. <coughs> so that was not a good surprise, for example. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.